been a, an amazing morning, hasn't it? Uh, the kids have done such a, a phenomenal job, and there are, there are so many people to, to thank. And so I want to do that right now here as I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk for a little, little bit, not as long as I usually do. I'm going to talk for a little bit, but I want to first just thank a whole bunch of people. So uh, Tati Neves was uh, the director uh, for the camp. Uh, she's been here this morning making sure everything's been working together. She's the one who initiated the idea, who brought it all together. And so if we were here in person, I would get us all to just give her a standing ovation for what she's done. But I'm going to invite you to give her a hand in your homes. This is very lonely for me. Uh, but r- right in the, in the comment section, on the live chat, email her. Just let her know if you've been blessed by this, if you've been encouraged by this. She had an amazing team of leaders with her as well. I want to name them, and and I I don't think I'm going to forget anybody here because I wrote them down, but she had Nate and Maggie and Rose, Phil, Hannah, Tennille, Chloe, Esther, Ava, Dom, Brianna, and Kira, uh, who were helping her out with stuff. And and our youth in particular were running the, the stations like the drama, the singing, the dance, and just did such an incredible job of it, did so well, did it with diligence and with excellence, and so we're so thankful for our, for our leaders who helped out, so thankful for Rodrigo and his video team. I think Samuel and Marlon helped him, and um, I got to tell you, Rodrigo told me he stayed up till 2.30 in the morning last night working on this stuff. I don't think he meant for that to be public information, but there it is anyway, Rodrigo, can't do anything about it. Um, but just worked so hard in the last couple of days to put this all together, editing the videos. Uh, I, and just about Rodrigo and Tati. I mean, they, they came to us in January, um, and, and that was two months before the pandemic came. So we, we got this incredible media guy two months before media wasn't just like a, a nice kind of addition, but necessary for us to be, uh, you know, to be worshiping together. And so we're, we're so, so, so thankful for them and just felt like that's, that's God's hand. It's, it's his grace. It's his gift to us as the bridge church that they came to us at this at this time. We're also thankful for all the parents who brought their kids, for the kids who participated and did such a great job. Thankful for Johnny and Toby this morning. I mean, what courage uh, to, to do this on such short notice uh, to kind of to, to put on this little drama for us. So, so thankful for all of these people. And again, just really encourage you, if you're watching, just to write your thank you to our kids, to Tati, to Rodrigo, to, the, to our leaders. In the, in the live chat, by email, whatever, however you want to do it. But, but let them know if you've been blessed. Um, so again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to share a little bit based on some of the stuff that they talked about at day camp and some of what we've already seen this morning. A lot of things, of course, have changed since the COVID pandemic. I'm going to say something here I don't think has ever been said before. I, I don't think anyone's ever, ever said this phrase. These are unprecedented times. I think I came up with that. That's original. I'm going to collect royalties on it. These are unprecedented times. A lot of things have changed. For our family, one of the small things that has changed, it's not a big thing, but one of the small things that has changed is that we've watched some more movies than we did before, uh, particularly old Disney movies. Uh, like once a week, we're watching like an old Disney movie. So like Cinderella, surprisingly entertaining those little mice you know gus gus like they're they're pretty and, and moving too like emotional surprised me uh robin hood good times with robin hood aristocats everybody just wants to be a cat my kids are singing it at home right now hey natalie and zachary you guys go ahead sing the sing the lyric you love it uh, we're watching all these movies one of the movies that we haven't watched but that we've read the story a bunch of times is uh, pinocchio uh, you, you know this story, I think, probably, about the, the little wooden puppet who, spoiler alert, but it's like, the movie's like 70 years old, so I think, you know, it's okay, uh, becomes a wooden puppet who becomes a real boy. And you'll remember Geppetto, the, uh, the, the elderly, saintly, skilled craftsman who makes all these uh, works of creation to bring joy to others, but then makes this one, this, this one, piece of, of creation, Pinocchio, who he really he wants to become more than a work of creation. He wants this to become his child. Now, even the way I've phrased that, you're like, nah, I see what you're doing here, pastor. You're twisting the words to fit your Bible point. So what? It's a good story. And it does tell us something about God's character. 
God as a creator, God as the creator, God as an artist. And this is important for me to remember because sometimes I feel a little bit skeptical about art. You know, I think about that painting of three rectangles that sold for like $87 million. I'm like, I could have painted that. Or I think about that uh, banana that got duct taped to a wall last year and sold for $200,000. And some guy walks by a performance artist and he takes it off and eats the banana as a work of art. But I guess every field, every realm has its oddities. I mean, it's important for me to remember that actually God is, is an artist. He is like that skilled craftsman who makes stuff and takes joy in it, invests in it. And this is what we've just heard this morning about God as a craftsman, as a God who makes his masterpiece. And we've seen, or the kids talked about it this past week at day camp. The memory verse that they had, that you heard at the beginning of the service, is from Isaiah 40. And I want to go into that a a little bit more. You know, there are parts of the Bible, we believe the whole Bible is God's inspired word here at the bridge. But let's be honest, there are some parts that we don't feel we need to spend quite as much time in. You know, the censuses, the, I don't know what the plural is, sensi, whatever it is, genealogies, uh, long detailed accounts of laws. Those are the kinds of things that we're like, well, they're important somehow, but you're not going to dwell in them. But then there are chapters like Isaiah 40 that you just want to sit in because they're so rich, you know? There's so much perspective, so much encouragement, so much hope in a, in a chapter like this. And I want to read the middle section of this. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a well-known chapter for some, but I want to read the middle section that maybe isn't as well-known, but includes the memory verse from this past week for our kids, which is verse uh, 26. So Isaiah 40, starting in verse 21 to 26. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes. Look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great strength and great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. We see a few things about God in this passage. First of all, that God is great, unimaginably great. God himself says, who are you going to compare me with? Who who can measure up to me? Who is my equal? If God is God, if God truly exists, then there's nobody, there's nothing in all of creation that can measure up to the greatness and the power of God. Isaiah talks about the great people of the world, the kings, the rulers, the princes. And he says they don't even measure up. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow. They're like chaff. They're here for a blink of an eye, and then they're gone. I mean, think about the most famous person you could think of. Not not just that you know personally. Quick brag, one of my best friends from uh, grad school uh, in a documentary on Netflix, he has two lines in this documentary. So I'm like really good friends with a Netflix celebrity. No big deal. But think about the most famous person that you could, that you could think of who's uh, had a huge impact on world history, uh, who, you know, just everybody knows their name besides Jesus. Jesus is not the answer to this one. Think about somebody else. Uh, this person, whoever you're thinking of, doesn't come close to God, can't measure up. You might feel super intimidated to meet them, to talk to them. God's going to be unimaginably, ex- exponentially infinitely greater uh, than that. Uh, the, the, the passage says that he sits enthroned above the earth and we're like grasshoppers. I mean, think about, think about what a grasshopper or an ant is to you. Think about the power you have over that. And that's just a tiny glimpse of God's greatness. In fact, Isaiah talks about the stars 
in the skies and that God is the one who made all of them. I think for Isaiah, in his, in his day, to look up at the sky and, and to, to see these stars up there, not knowing exactly probably what they are or how many they were, but just going, wow, that's pretty impressive and God made all of that. But think about what we know about the universe. Think about what we know about the stars. Uh, I don't think anybody knows exactly how many stars there are in the universe besides God, but if you Google it, the consistent estimate that you get is that there are 100 billion trillion stars in the universe. That's a one followed up by 21 zeros. That's a big number. To put that in perspective, if you were to take a cup of sand, uh, there would be something like 2 million individual grains of sand in one cup. One cup. Think about the amount of grains of sand at Kate's Park or Ambleside or Spanish Banks. And then think about all the grains of sand in the whole earth, all the deserts, all the beaches, all the sand everywhere. And it comes out to something. I don't think anybody's counted this. Like I, that would be quite the life's work to count every single individual grain of sand. I don't think anybody's done that. But the estimate is that there are seven quintillion uh, grains of sand on the earth. That's a seven followed by 18 zeros. In other words, if you had all the grains of sand in the world, that would still only be a fraction of the number of stars in the universe. And now I haven't been to a star personally, but I've heard that they're a lot bigger than a grain of sand. And God made them all. He's He's majestic. He's, he's powerful. He's sovereign over it all. Isn't that incredible? I like that like the Psalms say, the heavens declare the glory of God. So that's the first thing we see in this passage. God is so unimaginably great and powerful. The second thing we see is that not only is he great and powerful, but he has compassion for his creation. The, the verse that the day camp focused on, verse 26. Look to the heavens, who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Now, I don't know if that means that God has a particular name for each and every star, or uh, he might, but it certainly means that God knows about each one. He's aware of every single star. He cares about creation, knows creation, like a craftsman, like Geppetto. He knows and has compassion on his creation, and it's an expression of his joy, of his beauty, of his order, and so on. And this is important for us to remember because there is this knock against Christian faith, against the Bible in general, especially in our culture, that that, uh, that the Bible and Christian faith puts humans at the center of things at the expense of the rest of creation. Uh, and this is, espe- this is, again, especially great against people in our Pacific Northwestern culture where a lot of people are kind of wanting to pursue a spirituality that puts the earth at the center. It's all about the earth and humans on the same level. Now, it's true that the Bible does exalt humans, But it's not true that it exalts humans at the cost or at the expense of creation. Because again, what the Bible says throughout is that God has compassion for, cares deeply for, has invested much in creation itself. I mean, Genesis 1, the very first chapter of the Bible. God makes everything, including all the stars, and he sees again and again that it's good says this, it's good, it's good, it's good. In other words, he's, the, he's an artist who looks at what he's made and he's like, whoa, that's pretty impressive. I like what I've done here. He delights in it. He enters into covenant even with creation. Uh, Genesis 9, after the flood, after Noah's ark, God makes this covenant, which is like a relationship with commitments, with promises, like a marriage. Makes a a covenant with Noah, with uh, his family, and with the creatures who were on the ark with him. He's making covenant with the creatures themselves. We read in numerous places in the Bible that God provides for creation. Psalm 104 is one of many that does this. 
And verses 27 and 28 say, All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. And when you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they're satisfied with good things. Again, this is God's care and compassion for creation. I think about Job. Now, the book of Job is famous for uh, its, its, well, dreariness, its suffering. Job encounters uh, testing and crisis and tragedy like maybe nobody uh, or, or very few people ever have. And, and the bulk of the book of Job is Job arguing with his friends about who is to blame for this, whether it's Job's fault or whether it's God's fault. And at the very end of the book, God breaks through. He speaks into all of this and he silences Job, basically by saying, look, buddy, you don't know anything. You don't, you don't understand a thing about creation. We read God saying to Job, have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and clods of earth stick together? The answer is God does that. God can do that. God has this intimate knowledge of what he has made. Again, he's that skilled craftsman who makes things as a reflection of his beauty, of his order, of his joy. That's God's relationship to creation. And by the way, that has significant implications for how we treat creation, for how we love it, for how we care for it, if this is how God treats it and cares for it and sees it. But let's move on to the third thing this passage tells us. Not only is God unimaginably great, not only does he have compassion on his creation, but that compassion extends to humans. You see, the the middle of this passage, what I read, is all about creation. It's all about stretching out the heavens, the stars, and so on. But the beginning and the end of Isaiah 40 are all about humans. Isaiah 40 begins in verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. It starts with this, comfort my people. That's the point. And the very end of the chapter, in some well-known verses, God, where we, we read that God gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow faint. It's all about God's encouragement, empowerment, lifting up of humans. So all this stuff in the middle about his care for creation, his sovereignty over creation, just illuminates his love and care for human beings. As I said before, the Bible doesn't exalt humans at the expense of creation, but it does exalt humans. I mean, Genesis 1, again, God's making everything. It's good, it's good, it's good. He's finding delight in it. Then he makes humans. And he says, oh, this is, this is really good. At the end of the creation week, as the pinnacle, as the climax of his creating, there are humans. He goes, this is really good. This is the best thing that I've made. If you're a human being this morning, you're the best thing that God made. That's Genesis 1. Psalm 8 asks the question. The psalmist looks up at the heavens and he goes, I'm so small, so insignificant in comparison with what I see around me. What is man that you're mindful of them, God. Why do you even think about us? But the psalmist concludes, yet you have made us just a little lower than the heavenly beings. You've crowned us with honor and with glory. Here's how Jesus puts it in Matthew 10. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? In other words, sparrows, there's, there's a lot of them. They're not worth that much. You buy a couple of them for, for a penny. Really cheap. You can't even get pennies in Canada anymore. Jesus says, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. There it is. God cares deeply even about the sparrows. He loves them. He knows about each one of them. But Jesus says, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. There it is. Sparrows are worthy. God cares about them. You're worth even more. And let's go back to the hair thing for a second. We're we're talking about big numbers this morning. Uh, I looked it up. The average number of hairs on a human head 
is something like 100,000. Some of you are going, I don't have any. Thanks for rubbing it in. But the average number is 100,000. Now, if we round up a little bit and say there are 8 billion people on the earth, that means that there are 800 trillion hairs, human hairs right now. On, you've never thought about that, had you? There are 800 trillion human hairs in the world right now. Uh, and God knows. That's, sorry, that's, I was going to say that's 8 followed by 14 zeros. So not quite as many as stars or grains of sand, but still a lot of hair. And God knows about every single one of them. If you pluck out a hair, which I can't do because my hair is like a millimeter long, God knows that hair. He knew, about, he knew about that one. And the point here is not that God knows hair. It's not that he's like some kind of Jeopardy, you know, champion who knows all these trivial details that have no real purpose or meaning. It's not that God knows hair. It's that God knows you. He knows your hurts and your pains and your rejections. And he knows the source of those better than you do. He knows why you think the way you do, why you do the things you do, why you respond to things the way you do. He knows the stuff that you do in secret. He knows that your regrets. He knows the stuff that you've really messed up. He knows who you truly are, not who you pretend to be on social media. He knows who you really are even when other people misjudge you or misunderstand you. He knows your intentions. He knows your heart. He knows your joys. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what gives you life. He knows your abilities and your gifts, even the ones that you will never show to anyone else, even the ones that you yourself don't know. He knows your, your potential. He knows your calling. He knows your purpose. He knows everything that you've done, and he knows everything that you're going to do. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows you fully. And in spite of all of that, or because of all of that, he loves you. He genuinely, truly, authentically loves you. Along with other human beings, you are his masterpiece, as Johnny and Toby talked about earlier today. You are the pinnacle of his creation. You are the best thing that he made. He made you to reflect his own glory, his own character. That's how precious, how valuable, how treasured you are to God who sits enthroned above all the earth. Think about Geppetto again. Think about this this man who creates all this stuff to bring joy to others and then comes his masterpiece, Pinocchio, who he invests even more in who he desires to have the breath of life in it and to become his son. Now the problem was Pinocchio wasn't really a very good wooden puppet, was he? You remember Pinocchio. He was kind of rebellious. He was disobedient. He was a liar. He lied so much his nose grew uh, so long that birds came to nest at the end of it. Eventually, Pinocchio followed after other rebellious boys like Lampwick and ended up going out to sea, running from home, going to an island that was kind of the consequence of all his rebellion. Is that not what we've done? Have we not left our first home in God? Have, have we not disregarded his ways? Our creator, our maker, have we not disregarded him? Gone our own way? Tried to live our own way? Rejected him? Rebelled against him? But look what Geppetto did in the story. Geppetto knew that Pinocchio had gone out and, and so he went out to see, to, to seek out his masterpiece, to bring his masterpiece Home. In fact, Geppetto laid down his, or, or risked his life on the sea to try to bring Pinocchio home. And is this not what God, you've never heard Pinocchio used like this, have you? But is this not what God has done in Jesus? He's entered into our world. He's sought us out. His masterpiece, looking for us, wanting to bring us back home. In fact, Jesus went to the cross, actually laid down his life in our place for us. So that we, his masterpiece, could be reconciled to him, could come back home. And the result 
Well, in Pinocchio, I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of plot elements that don't really fit my point. Remember, pastoral artistic license here. But in the end, Pinocchio does become alive, becomes a real boy, becomes a son to Geppetto in a true sense. That's what we see in the gospel. That because God has entered into our world in the person of Jesus, sought us out, laid his life down at the cross for us, that we are reconciled to him. Our sins are forgiven. Our rebellion washed away. We are made alive in him, in fact, so that we're not just a masterpiece creation, but that we are fully alive, his children. This is what we read in Ephesians 2. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. He made us alive. Later on, Ephesians 2 talks about how we are God's handiwork. We are his masterpiece. We are the pinnacle of his creation. And in Jesus, he has done everything necessary to bring us back to himself and to give us life. And if that's not true of you today, if you are not fully alive in him, if you have not been reconciled to him, if you don't know that you are his masterpiece who he loves and treasures so much, that can change right here today. You can, you can put your trust in Jesus, and you can be made fully alive in him. You can become a child of God. Again, the one who made the stars, the heavens, the one who knows each of them by name, the one who sits enthroned above the earth, above all of creation, the one who cares for his creation, the one who cares even more for humans, the one who has made you as the pinnacle, as the masterpiece of his creation has done everything necessary to forgive your sins, to reconcile you to himself, and to give you life now and forever. And so if you want that, if you, if you hear that this morning, and you trust that, and you want to receive that, I want to invite you to pray with me. And you can pray something like this. God, I believe that you are the creator. I believe that you made humans as your masterpiece. I believe that you love me. And I confess that I have been disobedient. That I have rejected you. That I ran away from home. And here today, I also receive you, Jesus. I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross in my place. I believe that in you I can have forgiveness and life. I believe, Jesus, that in you I can have relationship with God. And so I receive that gift. I receive that gift of becoming a child of God this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And if that's you this morning, if you've prayed that prayer, perhaps for the first time, we would love to hear about that. There's a, there's a Connect card on our website. Our moderator will post the link to that uh, right now. You can fill out that card. Just let us know. There's a little section on there. If you've, if you've recently, like today, made a decision to follow Jesus, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to follow up with you to be able to help you begin this, this journey. Uh, for all of you, though, whether you've just received Christ, whether you have, and by the way, if you have, the heavens are celebrating. There's a party going on in heaven because one more of God's masterpieces has come back home and has become a son or a daughter of the king. So heaven is celebrating right now. But whether that just happened or whether that happened a long time ago for you, you know, the, the truth is that this identity, a masterpiece, creation, treasured, valued, son or daughter, fully alive in God, that's true no matter what. The world can give way all around you. The world can seem to go off its rails. That doesn't change. You can trust in that. That's this rock-solid foundation for your life. And so hold on to that. Look to the stars and remember who you are and whose you are. Again, we're so, uh, we're so grateful this morning Again, Tati, Johnny, Toby, thank you guys so much.
So good. Uh, thank you to all the kids, again, all who have helped out with this, Rodrigo for the videos. Just so grateful uh, for what we've been able to participate in this morning. After the service, if you want to connect with, with someone, if, if you want to uh, just kind of see some people on a video screen and talk to them, meet some of our leaders, we're going to post the, the post service, we're going to post the post service connection time link on the live chat as well. So we'll get our moderator to do that. We invite you to join us. Um, and I want to send you with these words from Revelation 1, verses 5 to 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Bless you this week. Thank you again.